Hi there, I'm Steve Chadban from Sydney in Australia. In the photo here, I'm standing on the east coast of Australia with a lot of water between me in Australia and you on the Ivory Coast. I hope to be able to join you someday, but currently travel is very difficult as we all know. I hope, however, that the following presentation is of use to you. On behalf of the KDGO teams, I would like to present an example of how I think the KDGO kidney transplant candidate guidelines should be used, but I would like you to think of how you would use them in the context of your own local practice in Africa. I hope you enjoy the talk. What I'd like to talk about today is kidney transplant candidate assessment. And I'm going to base my talk on a case-based presentation using the 2020 KDGO candidate guidelines. The patient I'd like to speak on is a 61 years old man born in Chile who had IgA nephropathy biopsy proven as the cause of his end-stage kidney disease for which he had received hemodialysis for two years. He also had comorbidities of hypertension, 10 years, um, 10 pack year history of smoking prior to quitting five years ago. He has gout and a BMI of 31. He had evidence of natural immunity to hepatitis B. Um, he was quantifurin gold positive with a normal chest X-ray. And also at the time of commencement of dialysis was found to have an incidental renal cell carcinoma two centimeters in diameter, which was found and resected following initiation of dialysis. So when we look at transplantation around the globe, I think this summarizes the picture where this snapshot taken in 2011 by one of my postdoctorate students, Sarah White, showed that at that stage, there were over 2 million people sustained by chronic dialysis of whom only the people in the blue rectangle made it onto a transplant waiting list and 76,000 only received a kidney transplant in that year. Clearly the need for kidneys for transplantation greatly exceeds the supply. And this is the same, I'm sure, in Chile. When we look at the outcomes of kidney transplantation, the main barriers to successful outcome are death with a functioning graft and chronic allograft rejection or chronic damage to the kidney over time. As you can see, these two courses causes accumulate progressively over time, unabated, we fail to improve them over recent years. And when you think about assessing candidates, we should have these two pathologies in mind as this is what we are seeking to prevent in doing our assessment. Our practice over recent decades from the 80s through to the 2020 shows that steadily we've been able to reduce the incidence of death with a functioning graft after transplantation, which is good. And the aim of transplantation is to prolong life with prolonged graft function and also to improve quality of life and save money. This demonstrates that over recent eras, we've improved our capacity to prolong life and good candidate selection is a strong part of that. Currently, a key guiding principle in selecting candidates for transplantation is that we should expect transplantation to provide a survival benefit that is significant and should be relevant to survival in the local area. The KDGO guidelines on the evaluation and management of candidates for kidney transplantation were published in 2020, but they represented three or four years work from a large group of people as shown here. And I'd particularly like to acknowledge my co-chair, Greg, Greg Knoll. If you'd like to look at these, they're available published in transplantation. The group of co-authors came from all over the world. However, I should point out there was only one representative from South America and no one from Chile. Hopefully we can fix that next time. These guidelines are intended to assist healthcare professionals worldwide who evaluate and manage potential candidates for kidney transplantation. The guideline addresses general candidacy issues such as access, uh, health status factors, immunological, psychological, and physical assessment. And in particular, looks at the risk factors and comorbid conditions that contribute to outcomes after transplantation. We view these individually. We do not synthesize the total comorbidities or challenges faced by an individual patient. And I think that needs to be done by the clinician and it needs to be done within your local clinical context. I'll try and 
illustrate what I mean there throughout the talk. We use the grading system to provide evidence. Um, there are two levels. Firstly, we recommend things that we believe that most people would want to recommend for their patients. On the other hand, we make suggestions where possibly a minority of people would want that course of action, but a significant minority would not. We look at the um, grade of, of evidence by A, B, C, or D. A represents very high quality evidence, typically meta-analytic evidence, it's clear. B is moderate level evidence, classically randomized controlled trial data. C is low level evidence from historically controlled studies or other poor quality studies. Whereas grade D is frequently just expert opinion. In some instances where um, trials cannot be justified, but management pathways are clear, we will make ungraded recommendations. And often these can be the strongest. Let's return to our patient, 61 years of age. So does age matter? And of course it does. This is Anne's data looking at patient survival post-transplantation. And you can see that 65 years plus clearly inferior to 55 to 64 and so on with the youngest patients surviving the best. However, in our society, firstly, the average transplant recipient in Australia, and I'm sure in Chile is over the age of 55. Many people do very well with transplantation and therefore we rarely use chronological age as a barrier. Some programs globally do not look at patients over 70 or 75, but increasingly that's been phased out in terms of a preference for including age coupled together with other comorbid conditions to make a final decision. This man had IgA nephropathy. We've known for a long time that glomerulonephritis can recur in the graft and cause it to fail. And this data that we produced nearly 20 years ago now shows that by 10 years post-transplant, recurrent disease is a more common cause of graft failure than is acute rejection for those patients that have glomerulonephritis as their primary disease. However, far more grafts are lost through chronic rejection or death with the functioning graft. And ultimately, when we look at patients with glomerulonephritis, their survival post-transplant is at least as good as others. Furthermore, we know sometimes there are things we can do to improve post-transplant survival, such as continued use of steroids for patients with IgA. Nephropathy is suggested by this data, again, from Australia. We know that other causes of end-stage kidney disease carry more significantly inferior prognoses in diabetes here is the classic. However, diabetes now causes nearly half of all end-stage kidney disease worldwide. We cannot simply refuse to transplant diabetics in terms of attempting to get better outcomes. What we need to do is to factor diabetes in with the other comorbid factors evident in each case and factor that into our overall decision about whether to transplant or not. Cardiovascular risk assessment is an important component because we know that cardiovascular death is the number one cause of death after transplantation in most countries. Here in this recent data from Australia, we see that the key point of cardiovascular death is perioperative and here, pre-transplant screening probably serves an important role in reducing this rate. And indeed, we've seen a reduction over the past 40 years. Mortality from cardiovascular disease drops rapidly for the first couple of years, but builds steadily and becomes, again, quite a problem long-term post-transplant. So in assessing candidate risk, we need to think of perioperative risks, but also longer-term risks of vascular disease. As we see, our patient had two years on hemodialysis, not a long time but significant hypertension, a smoking history, and obesity. So who should we assess for cardiovascular disease? The, our guidelines suggest that all candidates should be evaluated for the presence and severity of cardiac disease with a history of physical examination and ECG. There are no comparative trials of this. However, we felt it was important and therefore gave it ungraded evidence, but we would apply it to most people. Patients with signs or symptoms of active cardiac disease, such as angina, um, heart failure, vascular disease, should undergo assessment by a cardiologist and be managed according to local cardiac guidelines prior to further 
consideration for kidney transplantation. And here we would recommend getting a cardiologist who's familiar with transplantation, who can work with your transplant team and provide the best outcomes and the best advice. We suggest that asymptomatic candidates who are at higher risk for coronary artery disease by virtue of having diabetes, previous coronary artery disease, or more than two significant coronary risk factors, and those of poor functional capacity should undergo non-invasive coronary artery disease screening. And I'll touch on the evidence for you there. Which test should we do? We've got quite good data that shows that coronary angiography or less invasively, myocardial perfusion scintigraphy or dopamine stress echocardiography strongly predict the incidence of all-cause mortality or in particular cardiovascular mortality post-transplant and even more strongly major adverse cardiac endpoints post-transplant. So that's good. However, a negative test does not exclude having a major adverse cardiac event in the peritransplant period. And that goes for all studies. So does screening reduce events in itself? If we look at the diabetic populations, good properly conducted randomized controlled trials of screening versus non-screening prior to surgery or ongoing have failed to generate any impact on outcomes or indeed incidence of MACE events. In kidney transplantation, we are currently conducting a trial called the CAST trial, which is multinational and has recruited 1,200 patients to date, that is seeking to answer the question of whether regular screening of patients whilst waiting for kidney transplantation causes benefit or harm. Hopefully, we'll be able to give you the answers to that important question in around two years' time. Um, what about patients where you know there is coronary artery disease present. The guidelines recommend that asymptomatic candidates with known coronary artery disease not be revascularized exclusively to reduce perioperative cardiac events at the time of kidney transplantation. We also suggest that patients with asymptomatic advanced triple vessel coronary disease be excluded from kidney transplantation unless they have an estimated survival, which is acceptable according to national standards and your local expectations. And the reasons for this are that traditionally we had favoured um, aggressive management and revascularization prior to transplantation on the basis of Mansky's famous paper from The Lancet in 1992. However, the number of patients were tiny, they were, all type two, they were all type one diabetics and medical treatment was clearly inadequate by today's standards. In comparison, more recent data looking at the impact of coronary artery revascularization on probability of survival following major vascular surgery has shown absolutely no, no benefits at all. I think we're all familiar with the recently published ischemia CKD trial, which similarly randomized patients with severe chronic kidney disease, many of whom were on the transplant wait list, to either an invasive strategy or a conservative strategy and over a four year observation period found no difference in the primary endpoint of death or myocardial infarction. So it's on the basis of this that we make our recommendations. We also acknowledge, however, that regardless the degree of severity of coronary artery disease here, a highly functional group one, uh, my apologies, um, a group two with um, single vessel disease, group three with um, at least double vessel disease in this trial. We understand that transplantation of these patients significantly impacts their survival in a favorable sense in this over um, several years follow up, whether patients were in low risk, immediate, moderate risk or high risk coronary disease, uh, groups, transplantation yielded favorable outcomes in all three groups. What about patients with known coronary artery disease um, who've had an event? We suggest that candidates who have a myocardial infarction should be assessed by a cardiologist to determine whether further testing is warranted and when they can safely proceed with kidney transplantation. We also suggest that transplantation be delayed an appropriate amount of time after placement of a coronary stent, as recommended by the patient's cardiologist 
and your surgeons in terms of the antiplatelet therapy that is mandated by that procedure. We also suggest that maintenance aspirin, beta blockers and statins be continued while on the waiting list and perioperatively according to local cardiac guidelines. The reasons for this are that we know that among the general population, evidence that mortality is high um, for patients who have surgery um, within one month after an MI with a rate of up to a third of patients, including um, mortality, as compared to those who wait three to six months where the mortality is much less at 6%. With coronary artery stents, these are generally treated with dual antiplatelet therapy. These do incur a risk, an increased risk of bleeding, particularly at the time of transplant surgery. And the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy is a changing field. So we suggest um, cultivating a local cardiologist and asking for their interpretation of the cardiac guidelines being most helpful. And to then discuss that information with your surgeons to determine whether they are happy to operate on single antiplatelet therapy or even double antiplatelet therapy because surgeons do vary. This man had evidence of um, natural immunity to hepatitis C with likely early life acquisition being anti-hep B core positive, but also surface antigen positive, so chronic, um, chronic active hepatitis B potentially. Here we recommend that all kidney transplant candidates for be screened for liver disease with a total bilirubin ALT, and an INR and albumin. We recommend to delay kidney transplantation until acute hepatitis of any cause has resolved and that a long-term strategy for managing liver disease be implemented. So in this case, typically we warrant lifelong anti-hepatitis B therapy post-transplant. Thirdly, we recommend that candidates with cirrhosis or suspected cirrhosis be referred to a specialist with expertise in combined kidney liver transplantation for evaluation if that is available in your local area. And furthermore, we recommend that patients undergo isolated kidney transplantation if deemed to have compensated cirrhosis after specialist evaluation. This man had a positive quantifuron gold, um, but a normal chest X-ray. In Australia, um, this is most common in patients who've been born um, in Southeast Asia and migrated to Australia, you would need to um, consider both of these findings in the context of your local TB epidemiology. But in a global sense, we suggest complete treatment of active TB prior to kidney transplantation as per WHO or local guidelines. Secondarily, we recommend screening for latent TB at the time of candidate evaluation. In low TB prevalence areas, Australia being one of those, I suspect Chile the same. And we recommend this be done with a chest X-ray and um, a, a, a PPD test or alternately a quantifuron test. We suggest starting treatment for latent TB prior to or immediately following kidney transplantation in such low prevalence areas. And that would be our practice to treat with six to nine months of isoniazid. What about cancer in the transplant candidate? This man, we understand, had a small renal cell carcinoma incidentally identified by CT scanning at the time of commencement of dialysis. This was then resected and a follow-up CT has been normal. The context here is that we do understand that the incidence of cancer is increased in end-stage kidney disease to two to three-fold the background population rates both in dialysis and in transplantation, but that the patterns are different. What we see is an increase in the incidence of infection-associated cancers and immune-associated cancers, for example, HPV-associated cervical carcinoma or um, uh, EBV-associated PTLD in transplant contexts. Whereas in a dialysis context, um, the rates increase um, for cancers such as renal cell carcinoma and thyroid carcinoma, so-called ESKD-associated cancers. When it comes to renal cell carcinoma, we actually advocate screening candidates at increased risk for renal cell carcinoma, indicated by over three years on dialysis, family history, known acquired cystic disease of the kidneys or analgesic properly, 
by use of an ultrasound. There is no good comparative evidence here. We've listed it as ungraded. The pros are that ultrasound is non-invasive. Um, however, we're quite uncertain about the test accuracy here, and it is almost certainly quite operator dependent. Um, the negative predictive values, however, are likely very good. We are uncertain about the frequency of screening. There are also potential harms in this sort of strategy with possibility of overdiagnosis, picking up complex cysts, which are not actually malignant, but do end up generating surgery. And this carries a financial burden, um, carries the risk of more tests and interventions and anxiety for the patient, and it all costs money. What about the patient with known cancer, as in this case? How long should we wait before moving to transplantation? And here the guidelines have looked at all of the available evidence. And for some cancers, such as small or incidentally discovered renal cell carcinomas, as in our patient, we recommend no additional wait time. So too for superficial or in situ bladder cancer. So too for cervical um, intraepithelial neoplasia. So too for localised prostate cancer. And in my country, also for um, uh, basal cell carcinoma or early squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. However, there are other cancers such as metastatic breast cancer, stage three or four, such as metastatic melanoma or metastatic colorectal cancer. And in the majority of cases of multiple myeloma, where we would recommend uh, either a minimum of five years or often just contraindication to transplantation because of the very high risks of asymptomatic occult metastases that will thrive under immunosuppressed conditions. For all other cancers, we've recommended often a minimum of two years. However, this recommendation, in my opinion, is likely to change on the basis of this type of data from Norway, where the policy is that patients who have had a cancer diagnosis, who have experienced potential curative therapy and been watched within one year, should be relisted for transplant. And here in their hands, this strategy has yielded overall survival post-transplant equivalent to age-matched non-cancer-affected individuals. So I think this is probably the way we are moving globally. So I've shown you an example of one patient who was multimorbid, which is typical of all of our patients. The guidelines deal with one factor at a time. They do not show you how to synthesize this and put it together to make a complete complete picture from which you can determine candidate suit suitability for transplantation or not. There are some tools available to assist with this. This is an example of one, which is the expected post-transplant survival score generated in the United States. And here we've applied it to an Australian population. However, I would argue that these often miss the nuances and the granularity that we detect as clinicians, and consequently, they are not in widespread use. Instead, as a clinician, we are faced to put this all together, ideally as a transplant team. We need to factor in all comorbidities, add them together and determine the risks versus the potential benefits of transplantation in every case and proceed on the basis of informed consent to the patient, making them aware of their risks, coupled with an expectation as a clinician that transplantation should provide a significant survival and quality of life benefit. All of these factors are different in every country. So I would urge you to consider local factors. What is What are your survival data on dialysis versus transplant? Do you know it? How good is access to transplantation? How scarce are organs? What are your local skills, facilities, and funding to achieve transplantation? And I would encourage you to consider all of these factors in making your decision. I'd now like to include by thanking a large number of people. First of all, thank you very much to Afran Apna 2021 for inviting the KDGO team and me to share my insights into our guidelines with you. I hope that you found this useful. I'd also very much like to thank the KDGO candidate guideline working group in particular my co-chair greg knoll from ottawa in canada and the other 12 members of the working group from various parts of the world 
Thank you. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference.